Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, August 12, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Hillary's body count has finally hit the mainstream. Former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich is demanding to know the motive behind the murder of Seth Rich, the DNC staffer responsible for the DNC email leak. Meanwhile, WikiLeaks is offering a $20,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of Rich's killer. Plus, Rand Paul says Hillary Clinton could get five years in prison for lying to Congress about weapons going to ISIS. Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. During a campaign stop on Thursday, Hillary Clinton gave a speech on the economy, and guess what? She sounded just like Donald Trump, and everyone is taking notice. I will stop any trade deal that kills jobs or holds down wages, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I oppose it now. I'll oppose it after the election, and I'll oppose it as president. So, of course, the TPP is a trade deal that Trump has been lambasting since before he even decided to run for president. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, has been for this trade deal from the very beginning. Even CNN was forced to have to a report on the fact that she totally flip-flopped on the issue. She, 45 times, she was cited advocating for this trade deal. And of course, in her speech, she went on to basically read off of Trump's script. She also talked about uh, tariffs and getting tough on China and taxing businesses that move jobs out of the country. Of course, the fact that she sounds just like Donald Trump didn't get by with users on Twitter. They were asking, you know, is she a Trump surrogate now? <laughs> so she kind of sees where the country, um, where their heart is. They're going with Donald Trump on a lot of these issues. So she is starting to try and change her tune. But... Again, she is not a very good liar because we all know she's lying if she's moving her mouth. Now, here's something else that there's another issue. It's a very important issue because this one has to deal with our civil rights. And Hillary Clinton is basically running her campaign on the fact that she's going to take away some of your rights. And I'm talking about the Second Amendment. Now, she wants everyone to just kind of forget about the fact that she was actually caught on tape saying that the Supreme Court got it wrong on the Second Amendment. We weren't supposed to hear her say this. Someone leaked an audio recording from a private fundraiser that was hosted in Greenwich Village in 2015. Um, but, you know, th what the media is telling us that she doesn't want to repeal the Second Amendment. This was an article out of the Washington Post last May. Then they doubled down on this claim again um, with an op-ed titled, No, Hillary Clinton does not want to abolish the Second Amendment. And even at the Democratic National Convention, Hillary came out in her speech and said, I'm not here to repeal the Second Amendment. I'm not here to take away your guns. But on that leaked audio, she was heard saying, I was proud when my husband took the NRA on. We were able to ban assault weapons. Uh, he had to put a sunset clause on it for 10 years or so. Bush wouldn't agree to reinstate them. And then here again, the Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment, and I am going to make that case every chance I get. But she hasn't been making that case. She's just been going around saying, oh, I'm not here to take away your Second Amendment. Don't you worry. But of course, that's the issue, is that she is going to be the one that is putting in a new Supreme Court judge. And it's going to be someone that she thinks is going to get it right this time on the Second Amendment. And this uh, article out of Forbes goes into great detail um, about her record. And just if you look at her record, that's the thing that's troubling. It's not just that we have leaked audio and video of her saying these things, but also her record. Um, she's previously been in favor of gun bans for laws that prevent law-abiding Americans from carrying concealed for adding secret government blacklist to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, for national gun registration, and for Australian-style gun confiscation. So we have video and audio recordings of more. She's been for pretty much every single type of gun ban or gun control idea that's ever been proposed in the U.S. in the last 
three decades. So this is a very pivotal election, and don't let Hillary Lyon Clinton tell you any different. Something else that we're now keeping our eye on, of course, James Comey came out and basically made the case that they should have prosecuted Hillary Clinton over her emails, but then said, you know, no one would take this on. But he never really um, answered the questions from reporters there, whether the FBI was going to be probing the Clinton Foundation, um, if there was any wrongdoing while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. But indeed, now according to a former senior law enforcement official, multiple FBI investigations are underway. Um, this is, of course, involving potential corruption charges against the Clinton Foundation. The New York-based probe is being led by Preet Bharara. He's a U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. Um, Bharara's prosecutorial aggressiveness has resulted in a large number of convictions of banks hedge funds, and Wall Street insiders. So they've uh, been pretty successful being able to come after these institutions that are too big to jail, too big to fail. Hopefully we won't see that same thing here where it's kind of a slap on the wrist for the Clinton Foundation and we'll actually get to see um, some justice being served here. Now, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, in its 15 years of operations, the Clinton Foundation has collected up to $2 billion from donors. This is according to the Washington Post. The donors include a wide range of the world's wealthiest people, Eastern European tycoons, Arab sheiks, uh, African mining magnets, hedge fund billionaires, and Wall Street firms. The Post reports that the couple brought in $3 billion when campaign contributions are included in that total. So their fundraising operation uh, this is $3 billion amassed by one couple working in tandem for more than four decades. Um, Justice Department officials in three different field offices are in agreement that a public corruption investigation should be launched of the Clinton Foundation activities. And this probe was initially sparked uh, by a bank who was notifying the FBI of suspicious activity around a foreign donor to the Clinton Foundation. So we all know we've been reporting on the banks how how they have to now alert the FBI if anyone has suspicious banking activity. Uh, and here, you know, you're seeing it might be snagging the Clintons. But of course, the investigation, um, they were kind of going back and forth. Should we open this? Should we not? It was the FBI and the Justice Department officials meeting, talking about whether they should go ahead with this investigation. Uh, but there was disagreement. And in the end, the investigation was killed. So, of course, you know, very, very, very powerful people wanting to shut down any kind of probing into the Clinton Foundation. Maybe the disagreement was because they didn't want to end up like Seth Rich. Now, of course, um, Seth Rich was the DNC staffer who Julian Assange kind of suggested could be the source of those DNC email leaks. Rich was gunned down in Washington, D.C. last month in unexplained circumstances. His killer uh, not taking any of Rich's possessions or money, even though it's still being treated like a robbery uh, attempt. And of course, WikiLeaks has offered a $20,000 reward for any information leading to the conviction of his killer. Well, Newt Gingrich went on the Mike Gallagher show, and he was basically saying that the claims by the media that this entire story was just a conspiracy theory is absurd, and that, of course, it's worth talking about. Take a listen. First of all, of course, it's worth talking about. Uh, and if Assange says he was the source, Assange may know. Uh, you know, it, it's, that's not complicated. Right. Um, whether it has any meaning in the presidential campaign, I don't know. But obviously, if a, if a, an, look, I, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I think not only do black lives matter, I think all American lives matter. And if somebody was gunned down in our national capital, uh, we ought to have a pretty passionate interest in knowing why. And if it clearly wasn't a mugging and it wasn't for money, what was it for? As we reported yesterday, the family of Seth Rich was initially calling on people to help them find his murderer. Rich's family have now hired Brad Bowman. He's a public relations manager who specializes in crisis communications for the Democratic Party. Bowman's primary concern seems to be silencing suspicions over Rich's murder. And last night, a prominent source close to the Democratic Party actually got in touch with Paul Joseph Watson and said that he was right on the money with his reporting on this issue. So I'm sure that this is not the last we're going to hear about this story. Now, do you remember this? Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow, transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey?
turkey? So that testimony that Hillary Clinton didn't know might come back to bite her. What difference does it make at this point, though, am I right? WikiLeaks is now saying that they have emails that prove Hillary did know about this weapons transfer. Rand Paul joined Eric Bowling to reply to WikiLeaks' assertion. Now, if WikiLeaks, in fact, does have emails proving that she did know, what does that mean to you? It's a felony to lie to Congress. You can get five years in prison. And we can't continue to say that the Clintons are above the law. I do believe that the CIA annex in Benghazi was procuring weapons, some of them to get them away from the jihadists in Libya, but some of it to ferry those weapons through Turkey into Syria. And Rand Paul also pointed out, reminding everyone that most of the mainstream media was telling everyone that Hillary Clinton was actually the biggest advocate for arming the Islamic rebels who, of course, turned out to be defectors, enemies of the U.S., or now ISIS. They blew up all the infrastructure, turned al-Qaeda loose to run around murdering everybody. Now al-Qaeda has spilt all the way into Central Africa, all the way into Western Africa, and is just running around murdering everyone. All run by Hillary Clinton. We let ISIS take this position. It was Hillary Clinton that she should get an award from them as the founder of ISIS. That's what it Oh, oh, ABC's cut out right there. And they are now moving forward, rolling forward with massive censorship. She gets up there and she says, you know, ISIS is using Donald Trump videos to recruit. He is becoming ISIS's best recruiter. I mean, you heard the CIA whistleblowers like Tosh Plumley. He had to retire when he came on the show. You, you, you heard them all say, that she's running through the State Department a program with billions of dollars back to her foundation to send money out to all these different groups, and then the money just comes right back to her. They give them the weapons, they send her money back. But because the other agencies wouldn't go along with it, they had to kill the people at that base and kill the ambassador to cover it up. ISIS is honoring President Obama. He is the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. I would say the co-founder would be crooked Hillary Clinton. This can't really be happening that Hillary Clinton's probably going to be our next president when she's such a criminal gangster, so evil, such a fraud, and armed Al-Qaeda and ran the whole strategy to destabilize Africa and the Middle East. The people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. Well, voters have come to expect the mainstream media tilting the American elections. But what's new about this presidential election season is that social media and even video games are getting in on the act. And this is coming out of The Observer. Excellent reporting here. They talk about the propaganda skewing running much deeper than just the media. Our iPhones, iPads, social media networks, Google, and even video games are all in the tank for Hillary Clinton. It is chilling. So it goes on to talk about uh, an interview that the writer was um, conducting on Magapod, which is a pro-Trump podcast. And the show's host, uh, Mark Hammond, was disappointed because Apple would not run his show without an explicit warning label. Um, his podcast didn't contain any explicit content um, under Apple's policy. So he checked in to say, you know, why is this happening? Most other news uh, in the news and politics category isn't labeled as such. So on June 18th, he spoke to a representative from Apple. She explained, since the description of his show is pro-Trump, his show is explicit in nature because the subject matter is Donald Trump. Whoa, meanwhile, Apple has dozens of podcasts discussing Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler, and those don't have an explicit warning. So here is Apple basically telling anyone who wants to watch this podcast uh, that the Republican presidential candidate is explicit. Um, also, Apple has twice refused to publish a, a 
um, satire Clinton email gate game called Capitol Hillary. They claimed that it was offensive and mean spirited. And this is, you know, Apple who has approved dozens of games poking fun at Donald Trump, including a game called Dump Trump where he is uh, a giant turd, basically. And then so it goes on to just um, talk about iPhone and iPad going into the Apple news. So if you have it on your phone and you're wanting to get those news updates, the algorithms are total leftist propaganda. And WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has also said that Clinton made a deal with Google and that the tech giant is directly engaged in her campaign. It's been widely reported that Clinton hired Eric Schmidt, who is the chairman of Alphabet, which is now the parent company of Google. He, she had him set up a tech company called The Groundwork. Assange claims that this was to ensure Clinton had the engineering talent to win the election. Of course, a lot of people on Clinton's staff have worked for Google. Some of her former employees now work for Google. So it's that same revolving door. Um, and so that's no surprise. We've had multiple reports accusing Google of manipulating the searches to bury negative stories about Clinton. And then, of course, um, if you search for Donald Trump, Google will also pull up Adolf Hitler right there just to kind of just get that in people's heads that uh, Trump is literally Hitler. Just yesterday, it was revealed that Twitter's top executive personally protected the president from seeing any critical messages last year. And of course, this year we're seeing Twitter not only banning conservatives, but they've also changed their algorithms to promote Clinton while giving negative exposure to Trump. Of course, they're burying pro-Trump Twitter handles as well as hashtags. And that's why the people are in active revolt, even this guy. <laughs> to abolish, essentially abolish the Second Amendment. By the way, and if she gets to pick, if she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. From my cold, dead hands. Anybody that wants to make me unarmed and helpless, people that want to literally create the proven places where more innocents are killed, called gun-free zones, we're going to beat you. This we're going to vote you out of office yes. or suck on my machine gun. Yes. That's why you're going to fail, and the establishment knows, no matter how much propaganda, the republic will rise again when you attempt to take our guns. I've had enough. Let me explain something to the New World Order, okay? You're not getting our guns. 1776 started when you tried to get them, you bastards. And as Charlton Heston famously said, from my cold dead hand, you sons of bitches, you got that? You're not getting our firearms. Do you understand? This far and no further with your damn dictatorship. I'm sick of it. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. To say we're not turning our guns in and we're not running and we're not backing down if you want them Come and take them. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Hugo Chavez took the guns. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearm. I must tell you, the right to defend yourself, the right to keep and bear arms, does not protect your right to shoot deer. It protects your right to shoot at the government when it is taken over by tyrants. These are... The quintessential American right. The right to be left alone. You know you were lying, implying there's no election fraud or no voter fraud. That was ridiculous. Now, here's James O'Keefe's piece. Let's put the article up on screen for TV viewers so I can list it for radio listeners if they want to go see the video at Project Veritas' website. We should probably repost this, too. Project Veritas, uh, James O'Keefe obtains Eminem's ballot. Now, get ready. He's coming in to get Eminem's ballot where they have a record of it so he can go be Eminem. He's stealing his identity right here on television for you right now. Hi, my name is what? My name is what? He's at M&M's ballot. Hi, my name is what? My name is what? 
M's polling station, Clemson Township. Showing your ID doesn't matter, so I walked into the school claiming I'm Marshall Matters. Black hoodie, black hat, I gave his address. How easy was it? Hello. My name is Marshall Bruce Mathers. Okay, you just have to fill out an application okay. first, and then uh, we'll need a picture of your driver's license. Oh, you know what? I don't have a driver's license with me. Do you have any other picture ID? I don't. I left. I, I came from work, and I don't have my wallet. But the name is Marshall okay, Mathers. Okay, you have to fill out the Okay. Well, the balance, yeah, you still have to fill and, uh, this out. Blue and then you'll sign it on the back. So, you can still vote. So I can still vote? Yep. All I got to do is, is fill this out? Yes. That's right. You can go into okay. Travis County and say, Alex Jones, I guess, and vote. Yeah, and then you fill out a... But I don't have a, a driver's license. That's all right. You're, if you're, you don't have enough, you're, you're affirming. Yeah. That's yeah. why you're signing this. Yeah. Yeah. Your driver's yeah. license, just yeah. make up any name you want. Then you have to fill out your information with your name. Bob Jones, so Keebler so Elf. The middle name is Bruce, and I have a suffix, the third. Or if that is the middle name, is I could just marshal Bruce yeah. Mathers, the yeah. third. Yeah. yeah. They'll find you. They'll find you in there. Why don't but you have to build Okay, you'll look it up. Yeah. All right. It, it, the last name is Mathers, M-A-T-H-E-R-S. First name is Marshall. So you guys will let me vote. Marshall, Bruce Mathers, all I got to do is sign this thing here. Yeah, you got to fill both sides. Fill both things out. Happy birthday with us? The birthday is October 17th, 1972. Yep. That's a great thing there. I mean, you know, I was worried. I didn't have my ID. What's that? You have a really nice name. Oh. Are you related to a certain somebody named Marshall Mathers? Oh, everyone always says that, but, you know, it's, uh, I think that's like the rapper, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he lives in the area. Well, that last caller really asked for it. We're going to hit him hard. Okay, you know, I just, I, I have a phone call. I'll be right back. Just give me one second. Yo, sure. Yo, I, I'm voting right now. Yo, I, I know we got to squash that beef, but I'm, I'm, I'm voting right now. Yeah, I know, I know. I thought I needed an ID too, but they don't need it. All right, I got to go. That kills me. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to your calls. I'm not going to let that guy that was disagreeing dominate everything. But, I mean, that's what I mean. He's just slithering around, lying, knowing he was lying. Just go to Google, even though they game a lot of this, and just type in voter fraud or election fraud or uh, engineer testifies on election fraud. I mean, it's just there's literally hundreds of news articles, hundreds of videos Quite frankly, a few weeks ago, I started pushing the initiative to expose all this, as you've noticed nationally, Trump talking about it as well. And I started watching the videos and reading the articles, and I thought I knew all of it. There was so much stuff, I couldn't even keep track of it. Bloomberg, how to hack an election. All the fraud in Latin America. <laughs> I'll tell you this, at least you talk to the average Latin American. They, <laughs> of course, there's election fraud. Only weirdo Democrats would sit there and deny it. Here's a little news flash for you. Al Gore won the 2000 election. Al Gore. I hate Al Gore. But there was fraud. And Stone was the number two guy under James Baker running that recount. Number two. And he's apologized for it and said it was wrong and he's very ashamed of it. He, he changed course two years after with the Iraq war and went public. That's why I like Stone. He, he's a real deal. I should have Stone on to tell us about election fraud. I did in the first hour. But, I, I mean, this is the type of crap I deal with all day long because they know they're lying, but it's like CNN anchors. They get up there and they pretend and all convince themselves and then think because they call in and tell us the sky is blue. And I love that tactic. Prove to me a blue whale exists. Show me one now. I'm like, dude, election fraud and voter fraud is well known. It's like saying, show me the blue sky. It's right above me, but I don't have to show it to you. It's like, prove, prove to me that Abraham Lincoln was the uh, Republican president born in Illinois. Prove to me the Civil War happened and Robert E. Lee existed. Prove to me there was ever a Second Amendment. Prove to me there was ever a First Amendment. Prove to me. Prove to me. Hey, Alex. Yes, yes, Matt. I, I wanted you to pop in. Go ahead. You said that, uh, you know, he must have been a Democrat because he doesn't believe in voter fraud. But I bet if Trump wins... 
all the Democrats are going to come out the woodwork just saying, hey, it's, it had to have been election fraud. It had to have been voter fraud. I agree. Uh, do we have any shortage of proof of election or voter fraud, uh, Matt? I mean, we could spend 10 hours on it. Our bin has close to 20 videos of election fraud. And that's in the past two months. What, what did you make of his call, though? Uh, it's not the first time I haven't heard something like that. Um, I actually have gone back and forth with um, one of my old roommates about election fraud, and he actually kind of came at it from the same angle because it's not very widely reported on in the mainstream. And actually, before I started... Yeah, because they've made the law where you just walk in and take over somebody's identity and vote. Oh, yeah. And, you, you know, it was shocking for me once we started digging into it, just a little bit of searching on the Internet will uncover all these instances where people are, are just going nuts. And the reason why I recommended that James O'Keefe video is just how blatant, how, how easy it is to go in and commit voter fraud. It's hilarious. Well, other points on this. I mean, I mean, do you like my idea of taking that call and then just chopping it full of news articles and video clips? Oh, yeah. No, that, that right there would be um, a powerful thing to share with everybody because there are people who don't believe it out there. That's kind of the sad truth. You know, it, people just don't believe because, you know what, again, there are people who are good-minded people. They wouldn't think to go do that I themselves. agree those exist, Matt, but with this guy, the Democrats are the kings of retail low-level fraud. And yeah. so, and so, they are always every year, every election year, they run around and say it doesn't exist. You got to think like a criminal. That's the thing. But you wait a minute, think I mean, like a criminal. Rachel Maddow wears purple glasses. Does doesn't that mean like she's smarter than us? This is Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. I'm here to talk to you about the fact that there seems to be a different set of rules for the elite or, uh, you know, the globalists, if you want to call them that, uh, versus the rest of us. Uh, it was right, widely reported by Market Watch yesterday that the DEA was set to reveal long-awaited marijuana decision based on a congressional petition to reschedule marijuana in the Federal Register. The this Market Watch article says that marijuana is currently under Schedule 1, meaning that it has a high potential for abuse. The DEA's response, people were thinking, would allow it to be put into a less restrictive schedule. It would allow more research and under continued regulation. They also had the choice to deschedule, remove it completely from the agency's regulation, or take no action. Uh, for the past 20 years, we know that many of the states have legalized medical cannabis. Uh, using doctors' recommendations instead of prescriptions and providing it through dispensaries. Um, rescheduling it to Schedule 2 could have actually made it so that it had to be uh, prescribed by an uh, actual physician um, under you know, federal DEA laws. Uh, at the same time that we were awaiting that decision uh, from the DEA, we saw that the Obama administration had another member who was actually experimenting with cannabis. Uh, the headline here says Malik Malia Obama appears to be smoking pot at Lollapalooza. So Malia Obama was caught uh, with cannabis. She was puffing away, it says, at a cigarette, according to a uh, bystander who says it was cannabis. Uh, she went ahead and skipped uh, the DNC to go to Lollapalooza. And uh, even though it was decriminalized uh, cannabis in the state of Illinois, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's very, uh, I, would, I would call it irresponsible for the uh, president's daughter to be there, you know, smoking and, you know, in public and uh, basically in a legal fashion. But I guess it's like father, like daughter, uh, because we know that when Obama was in, uh, President Obama was in college, he uh, claimed that he did many drugs uh, besides uh, cannabis. He also used cocaine. So I'm wondering why Obama now, today, with this headline, DEA, marijuana to remain classified as a dangerous drug in the U.S. I'm wondering why Obama is punishing America for what his daughter made as a mistake. Why is Obama saying, we're going to punish everyone and make sure that we don't reclassify marijuana as a uh, you know Schedule One drug. We're going to leave it being at the highest level of danger you know to the general public. We're not going to recognize all the people across the world in Israel, in uh, the Netherlands, and other places where they're doing extensive research on cannabis. We're going to ignore all that. We're going to keep it 
as Schedule 1, although they do say they're going to open the door to further medical uh, research of the drug by expanding the number of agencies that can legally grow marijuana, because currently right now the University of Missouri uh, is the only uh, school that the government allows to uh, grow cannabis. So segueing into that, uh, we have a whole uh, issue right here in Austin with uh, Agenda 21, and this is kind of uh, you know related to this because it's all about how, like I said uh, in the start of this, how there's a different set of rules for the elite versus uh, the average person. So they want to ban uh, smoking in patios here in Austin. Uh, the article is uh, from the Austin Chronicle, Playback, the Return of the Austin Smoking Ban. A decade after the initial smoking ban, local health group quote, health group, hopes to stomp out smoking patios. A public health organization is working to amend Austin's smoking ordinance to restrict vaping anywhere smoking is forbidden and prohibits cigarette smoking on patios of restaurants and bars. The initiative comes courtesy of Central Health, a taxpayer finance hospital district in Travis County. The uh, owner of Hotel Vegas says it will put us out of business. That's a local bar here. People come out to drink and they like to smoke when they drink. That's nightlife. If we can't let people smoke on our patio, the kids will start doing house shows instead of playing here. So some of the list, uh, list of the venues here that would uh, be impacted uh, include uh, the Saxon Pub, the White Horse, uh, Mohawk, Empire, Barracuda, Saf uh, Sahara Lounge, and uh, Flamingo Cantina, even uh, Spider House Ballroom. Uh, strange brew, the list goes on and on. So they're willing to shut down these businesses uh, basically based on, just like they did with Uber and Lyft, which I'm going to show you a video on that, uh, but uh, they're basically ready to shut down uh, all these different businesses just because they think, well, maybe it's not healthy, oh, this is a public health issue, but really it's not a public health issue, it's an issue of control. Um, they're saying, uh, Central Health is saying that the amendment isn't about deterring people from smoking, but about protecting the public from secondhand smoke. Let's take a look at the KVU video to see what uh, local people in Austin have been saying about this. City of Austin Medical Director Philip Huang says he's for Central Health's proposal because it will improve public health, citing that tobacco is the number one cause of preventable death in Travis County and that there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Tobacco kills more than AIDS, crack, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, car accidents, fire, murder, and suicide combined, and it's entirely preventable. City data shows only 10% of Austinites smoke, so he thinks the majority of the city will support this ban. So this local health expert uh, on the city council is talking about how this is a public health issue. And like I said, I don't believe it's an issue of health. It's an issue of control. And the city of Austin, uh, it's, a, it's a predatory uh, city council where they are actually trying to uh, just take away a lot of the freedoms that uh, people have. Uh, for example, uh, it reminds me of when I lived in New York because they wanted to get rid of uh, smoking in cars. And now, and, and also actually drinking soda too. They wanted to ban uh, large uh, amounts of soda. So now they've actually accelerated to not only wanting to ban you smoking in a car, uh, now they want to sm ban smoking and cars in general. So uh, we call this, uh, or, or Alex Jones actually called this, the smart city screw job. Because here in Austin, uh, we have a situation where Uber and Lyft have been taken out of the city. So um, bad planning uh, with these smart cities and Agenda 21 has basically got us to a point Point where we have uh, no parking, you know, uh, they've uh, we've we've uh, been able to cancel out, you know, their plan to try to make us live in these uh, smart areas by, you know, creating this technology, Uber and Lyft, and now they've uh, basically chosen uh, the winners and losers here because they say Uber and Lyft wouldn't comply with the laws, but really I think it's a ploy to get more DWIs. Uh, it's ten thousand dollars every time, you know, someone gets uh, pulled over and. And we know that those uh, those charges had dropped significantly uh, since Uber and Lyft were in town, and now they're back up since they're gone. So it's all about uh, profits and also just increasing globalism and totalitarianism. So let's go to a clip of uh, Joe Biggs, Leanne McAdoo, and Alex Jones discussing this issue. Joe, you've gone over this. So now it's just going to be outlawed when or it's just not going to be here? It, it, as of 5 a.m. this morning, Uber and Lyft are gone. You can no longer access it. Uh, apparently, they're trying to negotiate uh, with the city to see what they can figure out. 
But at the end of the day, it's all about revenue. Mm -hmm. Austin wants their money. They want to make money off of this. They're not getting the revenue that they got from DWIs as much as they were getting. They want the drunk drivers out there. Yeah, I mean, when they put out these ads, like, we want to stop DWIs in Austin. No, they don't. By the way, that's why they admit that they don't ever even or hardly arrest illegals for drunk driving because the illegals just walk. Right. Yeah. When they're the ones that have completely gotten rid of all the parking downtown, you can't even find a parking spot. It was their city design. Yeah, this is the smart they're city screw planning. job. And then they're like, well, wait, something. It's meant to make you take buses. We innovate around it with technology, so they want to screw that over. So there you have it. The bottom line here is an overreaching local government. And uh, when we go back to uh, KVUE here in Austin, they did a poll on Twitter. 409 people voted. 68% said yes, banned smoking on patios. 32% er, said no. And that's out of a, a city that they claim is only 10% smokers. But the bottom line is it's going to shut down a lot of local businesses and change the local character of Austin if uh, the smoking ban passes. And they need to do a reference referendum rather than taking total control and telling us what to do. But this is a part of the whole Agenda 21 plan. They have uh, right here this article from Kit Daniels on Infowars.com. Agenda 21 developers plan car-free 30-story condo in Austin. So they want you to not be able to drive a car whatsoever. They're forcing you into biking, walking, ride-sharing, and public transportation. Uh, this is part of a UN plan. And so if you go on Infowars.com and you check out that article, you'll see exactly how it was developed by Hillary Clinton's husband and how they're going to continue to do this in the future. Stay tuned to Infowars.com for more special reports. Welcome back. Joining me now in studio with an update on those reports that ISIS is operating in Mexico, Joe Biggs. Let's talk about the fact that we had an ISIS operative uh, that was reportedly training militants near the U.S. border for the past year. He actually bragged about it in an Italian newspaper. Uh, but what's the new update? Yeah, I actually went down there with Josh Owens and we actually did some reporting. I actually took a a vehicle that I got from a guy, I had this local, and he actually drove me into uh, Juarez, Mexico, over the border, and into a town called Anapra. And if you go back and look at these Judicial Watch uh, reports and things like that, and the FBI has confirmed as well that they're a credible source on this intel, that ISIS has a base in the Anapra area, and they are operating their training right now. Now, what happened earlier this year, top-ranking Homeland Security official acknowledged that Mexican drug cartels were helping ISIS sneak across the southern border to scope out targets for terrorist attacks. ISIS operative Shaikh Muhammad Omar Kabir was reportedly been training militants near the U.S. border um, in Anapra, which is right outside of Juarez. Kabir actually brags in an Italian newspaper that we talked about earlier, said he was wanting to kill thousands of people in Texas and Arizona. An ISIS operative arrested in, and criminally charged in Ohio this month has confirmed the terrorist group has cells in Mexico according to federal authorities. And Judicial Watch has reported on this before, just like we have here at InfoWars. Now, what Josh Owens and I did, we rented a guy out a plane, flew over, found some interesting things, and then that's when I went into Anapra and got on ground and tried to find these little areas. You know, we found a mosque, which is kind of weird, you know, in that yeah. area, seeing as how it's a predominantly Roman Catholic, uh, you know, Mexican uh, family. religions right. that are out there. So. It was really weird to see something like that, you know, but there's definitely something going on, especially when you get out of there and then the FBI comes and meets you at the airport and wants to debrief you and find out what it is that you saw when you were over yeah, there. Yeah, because they're, they're... They're looking into it. They just can't go over there. They don't have the... It's all that red tape stuff, but there's definitely a credible threat. If the FBI didn't think there was something going on, they wouldn't have stopped me to ask me what it is that I saw. So there's definitely something that's, uh, you know, happening down there south of the border, which is why we need Donald Trump and others to... Come forward, secure the border so we can get this uh, taken care of. Right, and th there's another story coming out of Texas. Uh, two wealthy Sharia Muslims actually kept slaves in their home here in Texas. That's super trendy. A judge told them that, you know, this was crazy and has actually banished them from the United States. Uh, found them guilty of engaging in forced labor of their two servants. The judge was totally disgusted with them. Well, then they replied that the judge that they're being Islamophobic because Muhammad had slaves. So you can't punish them for having slaves because that's Islamophobic. That's their and actual, the, the, <laughs> yeah. That's your actual argument in court. Well, look. <laughs> You're being Islamophobic. The Quran said that <laughs> Muhammad had slaves, so we can have slaves. Right. You're going against my religion, buddy. 
freedom of religion, I was right. told, right, in America? Exactly. Where's the Constitution at all? Freedom of religion, as long as everyone understands that we um, obey the Constitution here in this country. And in fact, a Dallas mayor um, last year was like raked over the coals for explicitly setting this law in place that we follow the Constitution here, Sharia law, there's no Sharia courts allowed here. And everyone was laughing at her saying, oh, please, that would never happen here. That could... I wonder you know, how many Black Lives Matter protesters are going to go out and protest for this couple right here that had slaves. Yeah, well, and of course, the re they were able to do this because they lied on their applications of why they were wanting to bring these people in. They lied and they said that they would be paying them $1,500 a month. And of course, this is the exact same program that Obama assures us will not be used to get terrorists in. Wait, just no like no one's going to lie to bring people in. And, and you see here, they were willing to lie to bring in slave labor. So just like the con? The con job guy? Yeah. Uh, no, his exactly. job was to bring in those people from exactly. war-torn Islamic radical areas. Right. And just to, to, just to show you, I but mean. That's just racist to say. We're all witnessing Europe just kind of in its death Blast. spiral. And Germany, of course, with Angela Merkel wanting to make amends for the Nazi Germany of the 20th century. Now here in the 21st century, she's saying, well, we're loving and kind now. Just bring everybody and in. Meanwhile, half of those people are leaving and fleeing to Russia. Well, now they have a lot of Christians. They're fleeing, but what we're actually seeing uh, these Sharia courts popping up, as well as a Sharia police patrol is now forming there in Hamburg. So these they've got their bright jackets on, um, their Islamic State and Sharia police stickers on their uh, vehicles, and so they're going around policing residents. And some of the people here who aren't Muslim are afraid that some extremists are going to be harassing them. Well, like we've seen there, you know, the women go and kick. Um, if they're in their burqas or whatever, they go and kick women that they think are not dressed appropriately. Um, so a lot of residents are saying, wait a minute, like this is frightening. Why are these people allowed to come around and patrol these neighborhoods? They're setting up their own law enforcement there. And we have a government like Hillary Clinton allowing people to stand behind her to support that kind of action. Right, don't and, we also, and we also have her at the DNC allowing Khan to come up here, the Khan job, and talk <laughs> about how he wants to usher in radical Islamic terrorists. You know, and freaking Sadiq Mateen <laughs> wants to talk about killing all these people. So, I mean, no wonder these people, no wonder this is going to happen in Europe. It's going to happen here because our government's not going to punish them. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to hold anybody accountable. Right. So that's why you need the Second Amendment to protect yourself against these crazy lunatics who are bloodthirsty psychopaths that want to come here and try to enforce a Sharia law BS. Not going to happen here, buddy. Right. Well, uh, Hillary Clinton has assured us that she is not trying to take away our guns, but she's just... Trying to take away all. She doesn't have to guns. take our guns away if she allows a whole bunch of Caught on psychos. Tape, with, actually admitting that that's her plan. She so. has a whole bunch of psychos <laughs> with bombs strapped to their chest. I mean, a gun's not going to stop you there. Well, and also, too, they're assuring us as we are bringing in a lot of these refugees um, that everything's going to be fine and that even though they can't properly vet them, they don't know where they're coming from. Most of them are young men, not women and children, as we were previously told. Um, but now, indeed, we've been saying this for years now, of course, the conspiracy theorists at Infowars. Um, but they are saying secret ISIS hit squads are hiding among migrants and they're pretending to be refugees. This is coming right now out of German intelligence. These are hit squads and sleeper cells intent on waging war in Europe. If you want to find where the largest amount of sleeper cells are, go to Molenbeek, Belgium. Right. Uh, there are people there that are actually saying, you know, when they went to visit, um, I know it was a, the head of of course, it's not here right now, but he said he actually took the wrong, a wrong turn down a street and he feared for his life. And this is a government official who just said, I took the wrong turn in Belgium. I mean, me, Paul Joseph Watson, Michael Zimmerman went to Molenbeek, Belgium, and that is a ISIS stronghold. It was very intense being there. You could feel it like the fact that, hey, man, we don't want you here. Right. You don't belong here. And these guys are just sitting inside the rooms plot and secretly waiting to carry out another attack and bomb a whole bunch of babies and take down an airplane. They're crazy. Right. We've we got to stop them. And they're sleeper cells. We've said it before. Look what happened in Paris with the attacks. These guys took advantage of the refugee crisis, came over into the border, into Paris, and carried out these attacks. Then went back over to their little ISIS stronghold and just hit around. And well, and also, too, it's like the political correctness brainwashing that we're seeing because um, also, too, when we have uh, in France, 
we see people leaving, going to fight ISIS in Syria and other places. There's no law that says you you can't leave the country and go fight a, in a war. But that's the problem is that then they come back and they're radicalized. A uh, perfect example of this brainwashing is a story, um, the way the BBC kind of talked about it. So uh, last year it was reported about these young schoolgirls, these jihadi brides who left uh, London in February of 2015 to join the Islamic State. Well, they were reporting that uh, one of the girls has now died in the war zone. Well, the way the BBC put it, if you scroll down, you can see the BBC headline. Uh, it says, London schoolgirl reportedly Keep scrolling and you'll see the BBC headline. London schoolgirl feared dead in Syria. No, but she left to join ISIS. You're forgetting like a key part of that. It's not a London school. And that's what girl. you have to understand. She left to go join ISIS. Paul Joseph Watts and many others have done reports on how a bulk of these refugees from these war stricken countries that are predominantly run by Sharia law that live in London, Paris, all these places now. Support Sharia law, support killing people, support ISIS, support beheading people, support strapping a bomb to their chest and blowing you up. And it's going to happen here if we don't wake up. Right. Well, there's already reports coming out of uh, California with some church leaders there saying that they stepped outside mm -hmm. and there was a, a group of kids in a car shouting Allah Akbar through a megaphone disrupting their church service there. So, I mean, we've already seen what's with the, the priest in France there with getting his head practically decapitated when they slit his throat. So, I mean, we do need to be vigilant and, you know, not allow our political correctness to harm us here. Joe Biggs, thank you very much. And thank you all for tuning in tonight. We'll see you here again next week, 7 p.m. Central.